Matthew chapter 28, starting verse 1. It says, After the Sabbath, on the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look into the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, collapsed at his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. See, this morning we celebrate Easter just as we do every single year, the moment in history when Jesus conquered death and rose from the grave to forgive us of our sins, to pay the wages of sin, which is death. So he took that upon himself on the cross to die so that he could rise again and save us from our sins. This historical account of Jesus rising from the grave is something that has transformed generations upon generations of people over the past 2,000 years. It is and has been the most anticipated moment in history, the day that God saved his people from destruction by sending his one and only son to die in our place and to rise again to conquer sin and death for us. But Easter wouldn't actually be Easter without Thursday night and even Friday night. Because there's a few things that happened leading up to Jesus being arrested that I want to point and make out, uh, have your attention focused on. So Luke chapter 22, starting verse 47, it says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up. This is Jesus. The man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, They said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. He touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, the elders, and those who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you've come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you didn't lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Now, when you're looking at this moment, it might not seem like such a significant thing that one of the followers of Christ cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, who is called Malchus. But Malchus was very closely related and connected to the high priest. Now, we know which disciple it was because John tells us in John 18, 10 through 11, that it was Simon Peter who did this. So Peter you think about where he was in his life, he was very frustrated, he was very tired, he was very unfocused, and he was easily angered throughout his entire life. But what you find Peter at is that they're just getting done with the Garden of Gethsemane. He's fresh off of telling Jesus, I'd die for you, I'd die in your place, I'd uh, do anything that I could to make sure that you were good, I would do anything for you, I would never betray you. All those things, he's telling Jesus, they go to the Garden. And Peter can't help but continue to fall asleep when his Lord and Savior Jesus has been telling him to stay awake. So as he's uh, listening and he's falling asleep and he's getting frustrated with himself because he's like, why can't I just stay awake with my Lord? But then he falls asleep again and does this a few times. Well, then he sees Judas, the one that they knew was going to betray Jesus. He sees all these Roman soldiers, see these priests and elders from the temple come to arrest Jesus. And Peter, being in, a tired of, or being in a tired state, ready to fight, he's just ready to go. And so it's like he's saying, well, Jesus, you run away. I'll hold them off for as long as I can. And if they kill me, they kill me. But at least you'll be safe. So run away. Go as far as you can from this so that you can avoid being arrested. And he takes out his sword and he cuts off Malchus's right ear. Now, 
for me, looking at that, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would he just like intentionally go for the right ear, well, not the left one? Or, you know, what, what was he actually trying to do? Well, if you look at the original language, you can see that it was a very vicious swing of the sword, the way that it's worded in Greek. And what this means is that Peter was actually likely trying to cut off his head. He was trying to kill him right there, and he was going to go out, and, and he was going to fight him for as long as he could so Jesus could run away. And what happened was likely that Malchus saw this attack coming and moved out of the way, and as he was moving, it cut off his ear instead of his head. Now, why is this so significant? Because it's not like Peter actually killed him. He just injured him a little bit. Well, if you look at uh, Jewish law and even the Roman law, if there's an attempt of murder or if there's any type of injury that's done to someone unjustly and unrightfully, then it uh, is automatic imprisonment. So Peter would have gotten arrested. He would have been on trial, likely would have been imprisoned. And very likely, since it was the servant of the high priest, he would have been executed for his actions. So when Jesus goes up to uh, Malchus and takes his ear off the ground and puts it back on him. I think Jesus was doing two things when he healed his ear. The first thing, and this is less significant, but I do believe it's true that all the lies that Malchus probably heard about Jesus, because you, you got to think this whole group, everyone had a weapon with them, ready to take out the followers of Jesus and ready to take out Jesus himself. So they had been told the lie that Jesus was this dangerously armed person, almost like a terrorist. He's been causing riots throughout the city. He's very dangerous to the Roman government. He's very dangerous to the temple. And so they're all coming ready to fight, ready to kill this man if they have to. And so Malchus probably heard all of these lies, had never met Jesus before, but then he sees Jesus. And the first thing that happens to him is that Jesus heals him. The next thing that happens is that Jesus willingly goes without a fight, tells his followers to drop their swords. Don't fight. And I, and I love this image of Jesus going up and just washing away all of the lies that Malchus had heard, saying, hey, I'm going to heal you instead of destroy you. Like everyone else has been telling you, I'm going to come here. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to heal you. But the second thing is, I believe, the main reason that Jesus healed Malchus's ear is because he was saving Peter's life. You got to think if Peter as a follower of Christ, as one of the original disciples had cut off the ear and Jesus hadn't healed him, hadn't healed Malchus, right? Peter's life would have been in jeopardy. And even if he wasn't executed, his entire ministry, everything that he had built up and learned all throughout Jesus's life would have been completely destroyed. And it would have destroyed the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ because his followers are very violent. But instead, Jesus heals his ear. And what this also means is that if Peter would have gone to court, if Malchus would have said, pointed at Peter and said, hey, you cut off my ear, I'm going to take you to court. If Peter would have went to court, there would have been no evidence that a crime had ever been committed because his ear was healed. And so anything that, uh, any charges that could have been brought against Peter would have never even happened because the court judge would have looked and said, well, you say that he got his ear cut off, but it's still clearly on his head. So I can't charge him with any bit thing because there's no evidence that there was actually anything that happened. There's no evidence that the crime had even been committed. And that's what the empty tomb does for us. You see, when Jesus died, if he still was dead, then it wouldn't matter. We would still be without hope. But instead, Jesus rose again which means that he healed us so that when we follow him, what happens is we are raised into a new life to where when we stand before Christ on that day, on judgment day, there will be two things that happen. Those who don't follow him will be cast into hell because they will, God will see that they have sin stains all over their life and there is no sin that is welcome in heaven. And so he will take those people who didn't follow Christ, who rejected his own, one and only son who loved him so much, and he will throw them and uh, give them the perfect judgment of eternity and punishment and hell. For the wages of sin is death, as scripture will tell us. And so it's not just a physical death, it's a spiritual death. 
But those who are followers of Christ, those who have taken up their crosses and died to themselves and followed Christ all the days of their life, even if it's just a few more days left in their life, those who follow Christ, they will stand before God and God will look at them and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I see my son in you. So you're welcome to come here because there is no evidence that sin has ever existed in your entire life because Christ washed it clean. He purified you. He made you healed. He restored you. This is the power of the empty tomb. The empty tomb symbolizes this moment where all of our life, there's nothing left to die. All of sin is gone. So when you look into the empty tomb, the symbolism is that you're looking into this emptiness because there's no more sin anymore. Your sin, your has been conquered. You don't have to die a spiritual death, but instead you will live eternally with Christ forever. Jesus came. He took your punishment instead of you. Now, oftentimes growing up as a Christian, even as a pastor's kid, I always heard Christ died for you. You know, Christ died for you. He rose for you. And for the longest time, I I knew what that meant because I grew up in a pastor's home, but it it took me back when I found out that some people who weren't followers of Christ, who hadn't been going to church, they didn't know what that meant. I said, well, I'm glad that he died for me, but I didn't do anything wrong. No, Christ died instead of you. Instead of you enduring the cross like you deserved, instead of you getting beaten and broken, instead of you enduring the punishment for your sins, instead of you paying the wage of sin, which is death, he died instead of you. He took your place on the cross and he was crucified in your place so that you could live life abundantly, living within your design that he created you to live within. So when 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ, what this means is that uh, in the old temple period, in the Old Testament, they would give sacrifices to atone for their sins, but Jesus was given to atone for all of our sins, to forgive all of our sins. And every moment of Jesus' life was leading and demonstrating what he would eventually accomplish on the cross. But I love how even to the last moment before he's arrested, he still says, I'm going to show it one more way. I'm going to heal this man's ear, which is going to symbolize that all of the world, when I'm about to go on the cross, all of the world who follows me, who puts their faith and trust in me, those people will have no evidence that sin has ever been in their life. You know, for, a long, for the longest time, I thought on judgment day, I was going to have to walk up to God and he was going to be sitting on the throne. I was going to be looking at him and, and he was going to look at me and have like a big TV screen. And he was going to show me all of my sins that I committed throughout my life. And what I came to found out as I was reading scripture is that that's not true at all. Instead, we're, he's going to look at us and say, I, I mean, you've got Christ in you. You've never sinned. Well done, good and faithful servant that you're not going to have to replay all of your mistakes when you get to heaven. If you're a follower of Christ, instead, you'll come before him and he'll say, you've been washed completely clean. Well done, good and faithful servant. And this is just a small glimpse right before he goes to the cross of healing the ear. But there's a lot of other things that happened leading up to this point. Because God's plan to redeem and restore us all, goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve first sinned. See, Adam and Eve, if you know the story, you've probably heard the story before, even if you're not involved in church. Adam and Eve, they stole from the tree against God's command. So God commanded Adam and Eve, that he said, you can eat from any of the trees, you can eat from any of the plants, except for the one in the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that tree because it will destroy you. And what did Adam and Eve do? They saw the serpent in the garden. And they were convinced, so they broke off the fruit. Now, we typically think it's an apple. I think it's more of a fig, but we can talk about it later if you, if you really think that it was an apple. But they, they took the fruit, broke the fruit off of the tree. And when they broke the fruit off the tree, then they ate the fruit. And after they ate the fruit, if you remember the story, they realized that they didn't have any clothes on. And then they, they started to hide. They felt shame, right? And this started the whole fall. And we did the same thing when we stepped into our sinful ways. You see, whenever we uh, decided that we were going to do things that were against God's word, whatever sinful activity it was, whatever temptation we fell into, we decided that we were going to break the covenant of God 
and take a bite out of our own desires and fill, be filled up with what we wanted. God gave us everything that we needed, but we wanted more. And so when we wanted more, we broke off this covenant. And what God does is he sends his son. And on the last stretch of dying in our place, you start to see that his hands were nailed to the wooden cross, which is symbolic for what Jesus is actually restoring. Our hands are what stole from the tree. So Christ took the punishment for what our hands did by having nails driven through his hands. He was hung on a cross that was made from wood that came from a tree to restore the broken covenant that we broke, to restore what we stole. So when we uh, ripped the apple, we ripped the fig, whatever fruit it was, whenever we took that and broke the covenant with God, God is saying, I will send my son, put him back on the tree so it restores what was broken. But it doesn't stop there. The first messianic prophecy found in Genesis 3.13, which involves the serpent striking the feet or the heel of the offspring of Eve, which we interpret as Jesus today. The serpent is able to strike the heel of Jesus because we chose to walk in unrighteous ways, leading us towards a path of destruction. But God didn't want his creation to be destroyed. So he sent his son to die on the cross and to have a nail driven through both of his feet so he would take the punishment of where our feet decided to go. And as that would happen, his feet were nailed to the cross. Eve, as we know in the garden and the creation story in chapter two, was taken from Adam's side. So God took a rib from Adam's side and he created Eve. And the sins of Eve and Adam were atoned for whenever Christ had the spear driven into his side at the end of his life the crown of thorns that was placed on his head. The thorns and thistles were part of the curse of creation at the fall in chapter three of Genesis. And so what Jesus does is he literally takes the curse of all of humanity upon his head as they press the crown of thorns deeper and deeper into the school. But there's one last thing that you have to deal with in this story. And it has to do with the snake. In Genesis 3.15, I'll read it for you real quick. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offsprings and hers. He will crush your head. He's talking to the serpent and you will strike his heel. Now we covered the snake, the serpent, striking the heel because of the unrighteous ways that we walked in. But as I was preparing this message, I had this question come to my head. When do we actually see Jesus crush the head of Satan? And I believe that it's through the empty tomb. So I actually did a little bit of research on snakes. Um, I had heard something from a pastor friend of mine and um, started doing some research on snakes. And when venomous snakes bite you, snakes that have venom, when they bite you, they, they sink their fangs into you really deep so that it gets to your blood system. And when they inject the, the venom inside of you, that blood starts to travel throughout your body. And depending on what snake bites you depends on what actually happens. Uh, because different venoms have different effects on the body, but there's two main ways that it affects you. Vipers, such as rattlesnakes, have venoms that attack the circulatory system. So essentially, they do one of two things if they're attacking the circulatory system. They, they either dilate all of the blood vessels so that more blood flows through them, and then it starts bleeding out of your wounds, and it prevents your blood from actually clotting to save yourself. So you just continue to bleed out this slow, painful death while the snake waits for you to completely die so that he can consume you. The other way is that venom from cobras and mambra, mambas and other snakes like that, they interfere with the transmission of nerve impulses, which means that whenever that venom goes in you, it goes through the bloodstream and attacks your nerves, not so that you don't feel pain, but that you're immobilized, you're paralyzed. So that as that venom is working through you, you slowly become still and you can't move a single muscle. And when you can't move, the snake slowly begins to swallow you whole. There are some venoms that are 
attack the skeletal muscle system and they destroy it. There's others that go straight to, to tissue in your body and they will completely destroy it. Some go straight for the heart and try to, dis, or try to disengage and tear down the heart. Others will constrict blood vessels so that you don't give blood to places that you're needing to go, that it needs to go. And it clots your blood so that you clots your blood and your vessels and your arteries so that you can't get blood anywhere. But no matter how you look at it, at any type of venom, venom from snakes have one purpose only, to immobilize and kill the prey. So any prey of a venomous snake is left immobilized, suffering, and without any hope of survival. And that's exactly how we were with sin. We believe that we can play with the snakes but not get bit. We believe that we can play around with sin, play around with our temptations, but never actually get bit. And what happens is that once we start playing with those snakes, once we start playing with those sins and those temptations, and we feel like it's going to fulfill us, then it actually starts to bite us. And then we're left without hope because there is no way that we're going to recover from being completely paralyzed. There's no way that we're going to be able to stop the bleeding. And, and when we sin, this is exactly what we did. When Adam and Eve, they reach for the fruit, we reach for our own desires. And when we get bit, the wages of sin is death. It's not that God wants to destroy you. He's saying these are things in scripture that's going to prevent you from dying. Because I know how I created you. I know how I designed you. And these are the things. So when you start stepping out of those things and you start doing things more uh, than what I've told you to do, that's when you're going to die. That's when you're going to endure the effects of sin. And it leaves us without hope of ever recovering. And that's our sinful state. There is no recovery. That is until they created antivenom medicine. See, when antivenom... Is first, uh, was first created, it did something spectacular. The animals that were bit by venomous snakes started to reverse the effects. That if it was done quickly enough, there would be no evidence that the, or that the venom ever existed in your body because you wouldn't experience the paralysis. You wouldn't experience the bleeding. So what antivenom does is it's, um, they extract some antibodies from blood. When they extract these antibodies, they create it into a medicine and they they inject it into uh, other people who have been bit by snakes. So when antivenom hits your bloodstream, those antibodies start going to work and they attack every single drop of venom in your body and leaves it powerless and unable to destroy or kill the victim. It leaves no evidence that there is any venom introduced in your body. And for years, antivenom was used from horses. It was created from horses. So they would take uh, a big syringe full of snake venom and they would inject it into a horse because they realized as, the, as they observed horses that horses had a natural tendency to fight off and not be affected very much by snake bites. So they would inject them with venom and then they would extract the blood a few minutes later and then they would extract all the antibodies and create the medicine that way. And for years they did it with horses not only because of their natural ability to fight off disease or fight off snake venom but also because there was a large volume of blood so they could make a, a rapid supply of antivenom. But throughout the years, researchers actually found that there was one animal that was more effective than any other animal on the entire planet. And so when they found this animal and they saw this animal, they, they injected it with snake venom. And then they extracted the blood, they extracted the antibodies from the blood, and then started creating the medicine. And what they found is that this particular animal had the highest success rate of survival than any other plant animal that they had tried before. And you know what animal that was? It was the blood of the lamb. And you, you can look it up. They use lamb's blood that's been injected with venom to save people who have been bitten by snakes. So just like the blood of the lamb, who is Jesus, washes away all of the effects of snake venom, washes away all the effects of the sin that we have in our life, that's what it means. This is the gospel. 
So when it says in Genesis that Jesus crushed the head of the snake, this is what it means. We were slaves to our own sin. We were hopeless. We, we were slaves to the enemy. We did exactly what he wanted us to do, which is disobey God. And there was no escape. There was no hope until Jesus took on the sin of the entire world. And if you think about it, he took on every single sin of people who have lived and will live. He took all of that upon himself. And because of it, he died. Because of all of our sin, he died. But three days later, what it proved is that his blood was powerful enough to conquer all of the sin of the world. And so surely your sin is covered by that too. Your sin is still forgiven. Your sin is still washed clean because his blood is perfect. He was the perfect sacrifice. And what he did was he, he shed his blood so that we could use the blood of Christ. We could use his death and resurrection to heal us of our own brokenness that we got ourselves into. We were playing with snakes and Jesus said, I'll shed my blood. I'll shed my blood, the blood of the lamb to save you. So we can boldly proclaim what 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Because death has no more power over us. The grave will never be able to contain us because Jesus completely restored us. But in order to be restored, you have to follow Christ which means that you're going to have to take up your own cross. You're going to have to die to your old self. You're going to have to have a moment where you say, Lord, I don't like who I am anymore. I don't like uh, being against you. I don't like rebelling against you. And so I'm going to follow Christ for the rest of my days. And some of you here, you've never done that. You've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never, <clears throat> excuse me. You've never turned from your sinfulness and said to God, I'll follow you all the days of my life because I know that you'll give me hope. I know that you'll give me joy. I know that you'll give me peace and you will give me all that I could ever need or desire. And if that's you, if you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd encourage you to come with someone up to the altar. Don't come up here alone. Come with someone else to the altar. Repent of your sins. Ask God to give you the free gift of grace and follow Christ today. And some of you, man, you've been so casual with your faith that Christ just misses you. He, he sees that you're not coming to church like you should be. He sees that you're not pursuing him through reading your Bible and praying. He sees that this isn't part of your life anymore. It's just a, a subtitle. It's not the main title of your life. He knows that it's not your entire life and he sees you and he misses you. He wants you to come back to him. So if that's you, if you've been really casual with your faith and only following Christ when it's convenient, come up to the altar with someone else and pray together. Repent of your sinful ways and follow Christ again. He wants to spend time with you and he wants you to live your purpose that he created you for. And others of you, you've been following Christ faithfully for years and you know someone who's in that situation. They're living in death and their sins, and you want to see them redeemed. You want to see them restored. And so I'd encourage you to come up to the altar with someone else and pray for them together that they would come to know who Christ is and what he's done for their lives. Now, as we praise the name of the Lord during this last song, I just ask that you just come, that you don't be afraid of coming up to the front because you think what other people will think but you come because you feel the Holy Spirit saying right now, Lord, I want you to come. And that you come up here and you say, God, I just need you. I need you in this moment. God, I, I want you in this moment. I want to come back to you. Lord, I want them, those people in my life, to come to know you too.